Welcome to today's discussion on mobilizing resources for education, the crucial role of Commonwealth countries. I am Menaza. I'm joining you from Islamabad. In the national parliament, I'm a member of the standing committee on uh, education and um, federal um, education and professional training and CPEC, uh, China Pakistan Economic Corridor, which also offers a lot of opportunity. I'm also chair of the Sustainable Development Goals Committee on Child Rights and serve as the regional representative for Asia on the executive committee of the International Parliamentary Network for Education, the global parliamentary network dedicated to education. I'm delighted that IPNETS uh, is uh, partnering with a range of Commonwealth partners for education for today's discussion, which is an official site event of the Global Education Summit financing GPE. I want to firstly acknowledge the range of partners involved uh, in today's uh, discussion, the Commonwealth uh, Secretariat, the Association of uh, Commonwealth Universities, the Commonwealth Consortium for Education, the Commonwealth of Learning, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, CPA, and the Council for Education in Commonwealth, CEC. Thank you all those partners for facilitating today's Roundtable, and it's such an important opportunity for all of us to get together. As we approach the Global Education Summit, which is being co-hosted uh, by the government of Kenya and the United Kingdom, today's discussion couldn't be timelier. Uh, the summit seeks to raise at least five billion for the Global Partnership for Education over the period 2021-2025 and leverage billions more in domestic financing commitments. Um, and I find that in the post COVID scenario, the domestic financing situation is most crit critical. Uh, as I will uh, tell you later, we, we are uh, finding it very challenging in my country, Pakistan. More than 30 Commonwealth member countries out of total of 54 countries are currently developing country partners of the Global Partnership for Education. Uh, including Pakistan and Nigeria, which are home to the largest out of school population in the world. Very concerning. Of those 31 Commonwealth countries, only six currently spend at least 20% of total government expenditure on education. The globally agreed benchmark, according to data collected by GPE for 2019's budget. At the same time, Commonwealth countries like the United Kingdom, Australia, and Canada are long-standing donors to GPE. For GPE to have the best shot at meeting its uh, replenishment target and get 88 million children into school. It is crucial that other wealthier Commonwealth countries like New Zealand, Malaysia, and Singapore affirm its commitment to education on the global stage by becoming a GPE donor partner for the first time. So Commonwealth member countries have a crucial role to play in tackling the huge annual financing to reach sustainable goals, uh, especially for which already stood at $148 billion and is now set to rise to almost 200 billion annually due to COVID. We need much more financing in this uh, situation. And we, we are not, sure that whether it's the end of it or uh, we will have more uh, waves and more variants of COVID affecting education further. To dive deeper into the role that the Commonwealth and its member countries can play in leveraging more and better financing for education, I'm delighted that we will soon hear from an expert panel consisting of voices from the Commonwealth Secretariat, government, academia, and youth. They will speak to a range of issues, including the fundamentals of increasing public revenues, safeguarding and growing education share of those resources and approaches to efficiency, as well as the scope for innovative resource mobilization from communities and the private sector, and the role of external resources to benefit lower income Commonwealth countries alongside the importance of domestic financing. We will shortly hear from our first speaker, uh, Baroness 
um, Patricia Scotland, uh, Commonwealth Secretary General. I'm delighted that we will also hear from Do Dr. Sara Ruto, uh, Chief Administrative Secretary of the Ministry of Education of Kenya, as well as Professor Keith Levin, uh, Emeritus Professor of International uh, Development and Education at the University of S Sussex, and Pamela McLaren, Advisor and Head of Debt Management Unit at the Commonwealth Secretariat. Our first speaker, our final speaker will be Dr. Musarat Maisha Raza, Chairperson of the Commonwealth Students Association, whose remarks will be followed by a short panel discussion. I will also speak a bit about the education financing challenges in Pakistan. It is with great pleasure uh, that I introduce our first speaker, uh, the Honorable Patricia Scotland QC, Baroness Scotland, has served as the Secretary General of the Commonwealth since 2016 and is the first woman to hold the post. Baroness Scotland has also enjoyed an illustrious career in the legal profession as well as a parliamentarian, where she was the youngest woman ever to be made a QC and the first woman to hold the post of Attorney General. Baroness Scotland, we very much look forward to your reflections on the challenges facing education and young people across the Commonwealth. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Honorable Chair. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in our beloved um, Commonwealth. So ministers, distinguished guests, Commonwealth colleagues, friends, greetings. Um, it's good to connect with you and to have this opportunity of considering with you the need for innovative responses in the public education system to the global impact which the COVID-19 pandemic is having on so many aspects of education and training. We need such new approaches in order more effectively to address challenges to learning as they are now being experienced and also those which existed before the recent disruption and those which lie ahead. This means examining how we can develop more resilient systems for education which can withstand future shocks and which can be more efficacious in addressing existing socioeconomic inequalities. For example, by improving focus and outcomes of the school performances of children and young people from marginalized communities or backgrounds. The pandemic has resulted in one of the most significant periods of disruption to education systems in recent history, affecting nearly 1.6 billion learners in more than 190 countries across all regions. Closures of schools and other places of learning have impacted 94% of the world's student population, up to 99% in low and lower middle income countries. The social, human, and economic crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed perhaps more starkly than ever the inequalities and disparities which persist in our societies. Consequences from the health crisis are likely to result in contraction of global gross domestic product by 4.5%. For many Commonwealth small island states, the economic impact will lead to contraction by as much as 15%. So although it is clear that we are all facing the same tumultuous storm created by COVID-19, we are tragically not all in the same boat. The critical need for vaccination has created an uncomfortable divide across the globe between those who have been able to access vaccines and those who have not. The pandemic is threatening food security, nutrition, climate resilience, and the economic stability of small island developing states. We need a fundamental shift in the development finance ecosystem to support these nations in coping with such challenges and with building their resilience, integral to which is the recovery and strengthening of their education systems. 
To assist with this, the Commonwealth Secretariat has been developing a universal vulnerability index which could transform eligibility for development finance. We need to move beyond narrow analysis of GDP and per capita income as the sole criterion for assessing entitlement to support towards more nuanced and comprehensive understanding of broader factors that tend to heighten vulnerability and diminish resilience. It seems to us more urgent now than ever for the international community to reform measures of eligibility for access to development finance and continuing with business as usual would be to squander many advances already made and to jeopardize potential progress, which is so sorely needed. Education and innovation are the currencies of the 21st century, with digitalization shaping the future of work, learning, trade, cooperation and societal affairs. We therefore need to focus on the affordability of digital literacy, connectivity for schools, digital solutions for education, digital opportunities and employment for youth based on principles of inclusion, equity, and gender equality. In these extraordinarily challenging times, we need a bold new vision for education led by awareness and action, whilst aiming for every new investment, not simply to improve learning outcomes, but to multiply them. So I look forward at this meeting to considering with you how we can mobilize additional resources to address financing gaps, to increase the amount of funding from traditional sources. How can we stimulate innovation by building market infrastructures which transform opportunities for learning and skills training through the use of innovative finance? How do we meet the educational needs of countries and communities rendered fragile through conflict, political instability, or natural disaster, particularly in the context of COVID-19, when financial, human, and other resources have been overstretched or exhausted? These and other related questions of similar importance and impact are priorities for the Commonwealth collectively, and particularly for us to explore today as we look ahead and prepare for the convening in Kenya of our next Commonwealth Education Ministers meeting. And I thank everybody who is participating, not just for what you've done, but what you will do today and what we will together do to face this issue and hopefully to help solve it. So thank you and back to you. Madam Chair. Thank you, Baroness Scotland, for those insightful remarks and for your leadership and championing of quality education for all children and youth in the Commonwealth. We have just heard a very illustrative overview of the state of education across the Commonwealth. So I wanted to delve a bit deeper into the state of education financing in my own country, Pakistan. In Pakistan, we know firsthand the devastating impact of low investment in education pre-COVID. We had almost 23 million children out of school, including 12 million girls. And for many children who were in school, they were learning very little. And after COVID, I think we have lost 1 million children who have uh, been gone from the schools. Uh, the data is not there, but we look forward to having more data about it. COVID is compounding the crisis. The World Bank had estimated that 79% uh, of children will now be unable to read and understand a simple sentence by age 10, up from 75% last year. The bank also estimates that Pakistan will lose a large share of students from the school system than any other country, with close to a million children expected to drop out as a result of economic hardships uh, experienced by the families. We should be investing now in education reenrollment to get all children back into education. When schools fully open, remedial programs to address learning loss 
and in second chance education programs. But just last week, the 2021-22 budget allocated was only one five five. But just last week, the 2021-22 budget allocated was only 1.5% of GDP to education, falling far short of the global benchmark of spending at least four to 6% of GDP on education. This is deeply concerning and risks jeopardizing the futures of so many young people in Pakistan who for, for whom returning to school remains a pipe dream. Financing for education provides the route to unlock their future. The cost of failing to fund education is going to be much greater and result in a learning catastrophe. Without urgent investment, the learning loss that has accumulated over the past year will translate into significant long-term economic costs for Pakistan. Quantifying the loss of learning in terms of labor market returns, the World Bank estimates that the average student is set to lose up to 445 US dollars in yearly earning, in annual earnings, aggregated for all students, this would cost our economy between 67 billion US dollars and 155 billion US dollars GDP at net present value. I have seen how invaluable GPs grants and expertise are in supporting developing partner countries like Pakistan. I have seen how invaluable GPs grants and expertise are in supporting development partner countries like Pakistan to build stronger education systems and improve the volume, equity and efficiency of domestic resources going to education. This remains invaluable because the real progress in tackling the education financing gap will be achieved from domestic financing for education. In both the National Assembly and as a regional representative for the International Parliamentary Network for Education, I'm leading a global charge to call on world leaders to protect, prioritize, and increase financing for education. My colleagues in parliaments around the world, supported by the network, have been playing a vital role in encouraging and our governments to grow the share of government expenditure for education, as well helping to ensure that financing is made available in an effective, transparent, and accountable way that ensures resources are used to achieve equity. As part of the network's work on growing political support for education financing, we have heard from a range of speakers, including GPE's board chair, Julia Gillard, and Sierra Leone's Minister of Education, David Senge. Minister of IPNET have been asking their governments to make a pledge at the summit and endorse President Kenyatta's call to action on education financing. To speak more about the leading role that President Kenyatta and Kenya is playing in the effort to supercharge the commitment for more and better national financing for education as co-host of the Global Education Summit, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Sara Ruto, Chief Administrative Secretary of the Ministry of Education of Kenya. Dr. Ruto is outstanding advocate for improved learning outcomes, having served as CEO of the People's Action for Learning Networks and as a chairperson of Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development. Dr. Ruto, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I'm very, very delighted to be speaking um, with the eminent speakers in this panel um, today. In October uh, 2020, the President of the Republic of Kenya, His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, and the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom came together to launch the fourth replenishment campaign for the Global Partnership for Education that has an aim to raise at least 5 billion for the 2021-25 cycle of GPE and to give uh, additional resources uh, to education to support countries' efforts. And Kenya's devotion to this course remains very intact. Over the last year, we have witnessed widespread, universal, but highly unequal disruptions to learning 
due to COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic necessitated the closure of schools acro across the world. As we prioritized pr protecting our children, protecting our teachers and their families from the threat of the virus. The socioeconomic ramifications of these school closures, which included lost learning time, a widening education inequity, increased vulnerability to social and personal risks, including teenage pregnancy, and uh, quite a bit of uh, substance abuse, economic uncertainties um, related to the pandemic have put more children at risk of dropping out of school than at any other time in the past two decades. Indeed, at a point when we felt we can comfortably move beyond access to start focusing more critically on learning and quality, we find ourselves putting our pedal again on the access uh, issue because we just have to, otherwise we will lose children. We recognize that girls have been uh, quite specifically impacted by the pandemic and the ensuing school closures with many of them at a higher risk of uh, early marriages, um, ch early child marriages, of early pregnancy, of female circumcision. And so there is an increased threat to girls specifically in specific regions. And therefore we must again pay closer attention to girls. The pandemic also exposed the unequal digital divide in education and highlighted shortcomings in the resilience and the agility of our education system. For example, in Kenya, less than 10% of rural-based learners and less than 20% of urban-based learners had access to a computer or a laptop for remote learning when schools closed. The school closures also amplified the gaps in the existing education system, um, even before COVID, and have highlighted the need for us to equip all children with the skills that they need with, that will enable them to seize the opportunities of the 21st century. In order to protect the future of our children, we must prioritize, we must safeguard and augment our investments in education, even as we continue to address the health and economic impacts of the pandemic. Kenya is fully aware that domestic financing is and will remain the most significant and sustainable form of funding for education. In recognition of the importance of domestic financing in building and sustaining education systems, Kenya through the leadership of His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta has continued to make substantial investments in education. Over the past 20 years, we have maintained our education expenditure around 20% of the total government expenditure. In Kenya's forthcoming budget for the 2022 financial year, education spending is estimated at 25.9%, almost 26% of Kenya's total government expenditure, which is corresponding to 4.1% of the nominal GDP. The level of ex expenditure underpins an increasing trend in budget allocation over the period 2020 to 20, 2010 to 2017, uh, where we had an 18.3% of total government expenditure, which marked a significant decline relative to total education expenditure over the decade from 2000 to 2009, which was on average 25% of the total expenditure. The government of Kenya remains dedicated to building on these investments by protecting and enhancing domestic financing. In testament to our wholesome endorsement of the Global Education Summit, financing G GDP 2021 to 25, head of state call to action on education, which is graciously spearheaded by President Kenyatta, we hereby commit that Kenya will maintain equally ambitious levels of investment in education and continue to allocate at least 20% of the total annual expenditure to the education sector. We believe that our actions today shape the world we live in tomorrow. As co-hosts of 2021 Global Education Summit, 
Kenya calls upon all other developing countries to safeguard critical investments in education during the COVID and post-COVID era. As outlined in the Heads of State Collective Call to Action, we hope that all GDP, uh, GPE beneficiary countries will commit to work together towards reaching and maintaining the global benchmark allocation of a minimum of 20% of public expenditure to education. As a GPE member and partner since 2005, Kenya is fully aware of the importance of partnerships in ensuring progressive reform in the education sector. Partnership with GPE has augmented the government's effort to implement much hailed reforms in the education sector. For example, with the support of, GP, G, uh, of GPE, Kenya has improved gender parity in uh, enrollment of girls and boys. We have trained more than 100,000 primary school teachers in innovative ways of teaching math. Uh, we have secured up to 70% in cost savings for the purchase of textbooks through changes in the procurement systems. Uh, where we now have more than 60 million textbooks distributed in all primary and secondary schools. And in effect, we now have a one-to-one -one textbook ratio. So in other words, uh, when you're talking about the learning inputs, you know, the business is quite done, which allows us therefore to pay attention to other critical things that will ensure increased uh, learning outcomes for all children to ensure that they have the skills and competencies to compete in an increasingly competitive world. Amongst other achievements, Kenya's persistent commit, commitment to education over the years has enabled the rollout of key programs such as the free primary and uh, free um, uh, secondary in day schools. And we, have, uh, we now have the 100% transition policy from primary to secondary. We have a full waiver of national examination fees for all students, whether in public or private schools. And these initiatives have quite decreased the financial barriers to education by ensuring that all children, particularly those in hard to reach areas and in urban informal centers, settlements, get an equal opportunity to complete basic education. And in order to equip our learners with 21st century skills, the government of Kenya is undertaking major education reforms towards nurturing every learner's potential and talent through the implementation of the competency-based curriculum. The competency-based curriculum, which emphasizes what children can do, not what only they know, it emphasizes getting to the child where they are, not where the curriculum expects them to be, um, is improving our chances of allowing children to learn to thrive. And this was a process that was arrived through a stakeholder-led approach and is expected to result in transformative changes within the Kenya's education sector. And it is one way in which we are consistently seeking to move beyond just learning inputs to ensuring that children have desirable uh, learning outcomes. The government of Kenya also remains committed to addressing equity and inclusion in the education sector and has over the years sustained investments in infrastructure, uh, instructional materials and support for learners with special needs. Indeed, every child who has special needs um, receives in a uh, higher capitation that is supposed to ensure that at least uh, we have resources to cater for the various disabilities they have, because we acknowledge that the burden of disability needs to be borne by the state. The Kenyan government is also fully cognizant of the importance of evidence-based decision-making rooted in the availability of credible and reliable data. The 2021 Global Financing Summit takes place during an extraordinary year. The impact of COVID-19 pandemic has increased existing inequalities in education and brought about the likelihood of unprecedented global education crisis. The future of our children is at great risk. Investing in GP is one of the most impactful steps that we as a collective global community 
can make to mitigate against the looming crisis. We therefore call upon all GPE partners to boost support for GPE. And together with my Minister of Education, who sent his word, he has joined everybody in endorsing um, our pre President Uhuru's call, together with UK Prime Minister's call and other world leaders to join hands together for the future of our children. Thank you. Thank you. I, I Thank you, Dr. Ruto. Uh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Ruto. There is so much that we can learn from Kenya and the great priority that has been placed on investing in education as the key driver to achieve Kenya's vision of becoming a newly um, industrialized nation by 2030. Now I'm delighted to return to my alma mater of the University of Sussex and hear from Professor Keith Levin, uh, Emeritus Press Professor of International Development and Education, who will speak more about the scale of the financial challenge to achieve SDG 4 and the importance of domestic resource mobilization. Professor Levin has been at uh, Sussex University since 1972, where he developed and directed the Center for International Education for 17 years and is recognized globally for his work on education and development. Professor Levin, the floor is yours. Th thank you, thank you uh, very much for that very kind and flattering in in uh, introduction. It's always nice to see an alumni. Well, I've got, uh, I believe I've got 10 minutes to say something that uh, I hope will intrigue you to think perhaps a little differently about some aspects of the problems that you have characterized so well in the previous uh, contributions. We're all concerned at the moment, or at least those of us who work in the development business, with the three C's, with cuts, with COVID, and we should be concerned with climate change. Those three things are going to preoccupy us on different timescales, but the underlying structural drivers of the problems that we confront, I think, are independent of those, though they are clearly interactive. So let me just outline a few thoughts. First of all, I heard the target of 4 to 6% of GDP being mentioned as necessary to achieve SDG 4. This is overly optimistic. At least 6% will be needed in the poorest countries and indeed in many low middle income countries, especially if they have not undergone demographic transition. Uh, the differences are very stark in terms of the magnitude of the problem. Uh, some countries with demographic transition um, have this pretty much the same number of children or young people of school age as they do of adults paying tax. Um, but in a poor country without demographic transition, the number of children is much greater. It makes it much more difficult to find a way of honoring the promise of universal enrollment from, K, uh, for, from uh, preschool to, to grade 12. That's the reality. It's not something we can change because most of those, those children have already been born. Um, but it is something that we have to plan for. And we have to recognize uh, what kind of challenge it creates for us. In fact, uh, the 20% target for uh, government budget expenditure, 20% of total government expenditure, is only being met by about 25% of countries. Uh, now, that wouldn't be so bad if you thought that somehow you could change it rapidly. But the truth is that when we run 20 or even 30 or 40 year sequences, we find that the numbers get stuck around, 20, not 20%, but around 15, 16% of government budgets and around 4% uh, of GDP when 6% would be needed. So we've got to think more carefully about what we can do. Clearly we can improve delivery through investments in effectiveness and efficiency. But we've also got to look at the revenue side um, because the revenue side is indeed the key to this question of how to, how to generate sustainable educational development that can be financed. Domestic revenue needs to be increased, not least because no feasible amount of aid will be sufficient to meet the gaps that were referred to. Sub-Saharan Africa has a shortfall of at least 40 billion and may, maybe more on recurrent expenditure if all children were to reach grade 12. Um, 
that 40 billion can be compared with the total spend on basic education of the development agencies, which is more like 2 billion. So the distance between what is being spent and what is needed is huge. And, and of course, the solution, as many people are now uh, observing, lies in the 95% of expenditure, which is financed from domestic revenues. How do we make more use of that? And how do we indeed collect it more efficiently and effectively? So that's a position I think that lots of people can agree on. And there is some good news, by the way, on this story that we must plan for and we must accommodate. More than a third of low-income countries should become low-middle income by 2030, barring force majeure. Obviously, COVID has disrupted that progress, but it will return. GDP growth will return. Uh, and uh, if it's not a third, it will be 25%. Move themselves from being low income to low middle income. This is part of a pathway towards becoming what we can call a fiscal state. As countries get richer, they become more and more able to finance public services and public goods from their domestic revenue without depending on external financing. And that surely must be a goal of the SDGs to move towards becoming fiscal states. And if it's a goal of the SDGs, a new goal, it's not stated explicitly. But if it, if it is a goal, um, then it's something that everything we do should contribute to in one way or another. How does that apply to education system? Well, it applies in many different ways, but uh, in order to get higher rates of participation and address what is often described as a learning crisis, but which is in reality also very much a financing crisis, and we have to look at how we deliver educational services, how we make them more efficient and how we make them more effective. In the least efficient systems, twice, even three times as many children could complete secondary school at the same cost if they operated at the same level of efficiency as the most efficient systems. This is about teacher deployment. It's about time on task, it's about learning. It's about time lost to learning through traveling and all sorts of other disruptive elements of the way systems are planned. We have to somehow address these questions and we have to address them at the level of different systems. We have to address them in a equifinal way. An equifinal way means that there's more than one way to get a good result, to get the same result. And we haven't been very good at that within the SDG framework. We have been homogenizing we have been creating global goals when what we need is national goals that respond to starting points and levels of achievement by countries on the pathway that they wish to choose. And there's no necessary sense in which every country should choose the same pathway. So that lays out some of the elements of the challenge. And what I didn't say is that the third element in the critical equation for educational financing, that is, uh, tax revenue as a percent of GDP, which has to coexist with the proportion the government budget has spent and the percent of GDP, is at the heart of a new approach. And that's very encouraging to see that both many member states uh, and the G GPE, of course, is now recognised this. The problem will be to realise it. It's not the first thing these things have been said, but it may be the first time that they've been taken sufficiently seriously to be enacted. The average tax GDP ratio in uh, low middle income countries is around 15 or 16% of GDP. If you could raise that to 18% of GDP, you would cover the 30 billion deficit that I said existed as a financial gap in the systems of Sub-Saharan Africa. You can do the same equation elsewhere with slightly different numbers, but come up with the same result. The leverage, um, that's created by increasing tax revenue is extraordinary relative to other things that have proved exceedingly difficult to do. So we haven't been able to shift the proportion of government expenditure on average across low and low middle income countries over 20 or 30 years. It just hasn't happened. It hasn't happened despite pleas to do this at Jiangtian, at Dakar, and most recently in Chiang. Increasing the percent of GDP which is spent on education also hasn't happened. 
it's hovered in low middle income countries at around 4.5%. Uh, and in low income countries, I'm afraid it's less than 4%. This is never going to be enough. And the point, of course, is that external assistance cannot fill that gap. And it certainly can't fill it in a recurrent way. We see the risks involved in using external financing to support recurrent expenditure when aid agencies are forced for one reason or another to reduce their level of expenditure. So focusing on the revenue side of the equation, focusing on the issue of how do we use education policy and educational aid for that matter to promote progress towards a fiscal state which can finance its own services and take control, of course, as it rightly should, uh, of all those things which go into the aspirations and realities of educational development. Uh, how can we do that? How can we re 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 revisit uh, the, the issues? Well, as a short uh, story to, to, to end my contribution here, I invite you to go and visit my website, keithlewin.net, which has uh, a paper I did recently on this subject, um, uh, uh, in IGED, uh, and please do that. But the argument that behind it is it's time now to reapproach the question of what aid is for. Given that it is in most countries not much more than 5%, and in some countries 1% or 2% of total education spending, you have to see it as a catalytic opportunity, an opportunity to get a big effect for a small amount of money, which critically is not temporary, it's permanent that it manages to perform the trick of flicking a system from being relatively inefficient to relatively efficient. Now, there are many ways of doing that. We don't have time to go into it, but I think it implies, amongst other things, giving some reflective thought to these things. First of all, grants and loans should only really be contracted if you have a very clear exit route. You shouldn't agree, certainly, to lend money unless you know how to stop borrowing it. Uh, sorry, you shouldn't agree to borrow money unless you know how to repay it and how to avoid having to borrow it again. And if you accept grants, you should be doing it on the basis that whatever recurrent implications arise from giving those grants, building buildings, for example, um, has a recurrent element which is covered uh, by uh, a, a proper financing arrangement. So that's one thing. External financing really should only be used when it is not possible to use domestic financing for it. Uh, that, I mean, that sounds an obvious thing to say, but um, fortunately there are plenty of um, examples where I don't think that really is true. I think we should be much more clear in our own minds about what the comparative advantage of external resource support is and what its consequences are. And as I've already said, what the exit routes are. Thirdly, we have to judge whether or not we're successful, not by the short-term results of our projects, but by whether they are indeed sustainable and whether after an agency has left, after the credit line has been withdrawn or paid down, after the grant has finished five years later, is there an enduring effect? And I think if we did that, we would find ourselves progressing towards the idea that we're supporting the development of fiscal states and much, uh, in a much more positive way. And I think the last thing that I and I think it's particularly timely to draw attention to, is the extent to which what we are doing here with Catalytic A should also be part of the party which promotes um, uh, net zero. The SDG4 and uh, many externally financed projects in the recent past have not really taken seriously um, the environmental burden that they create. Sending more children to school does indeed create a, 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 a greater carbon burden, but it's much worse, it can be much worse than that. One of the largest sources of emissions and airborne pollutants in many developing country cities is indeed carrying children to school in vehicles. We haven't planned our school systems in a way that minimizes transport costs and pollution costs. So I leave you with that thought, and I leave you with the thought that in the Brundtland report, the definition of sustainable development was um, that you have to value the future over the present. We have to look at our projects and the way in which our business models operate discount rates on the future, which run the risk of destroying our collective future. We don't want a discount rate, we want a recount rate. 
which will allow us to have sharks in the sea, giraffes on the plains and birds in the air. And our education systems, the way we finance them, are all part of that. And sending more kids to school, of course, uh, if we double the number of children in school, we are doubling the carbon emissions that are related to that, unless we act in a way which we create greater efficiency and effectiveness, and we build our schools so less travel to arrange and that the air conditioning is financed from renewable resources and so on. So I leave you with those thoughts, but it's time now we have a great opportunity to look again when the GPE is replenished at how that very special money, that grant aid, um, can be used to encourage and support the development of fiscal states that make their own decisions about how best to finance progress towards the goals they value. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Levin, for those very insightful remarks and uh, leaves us all to think about all what you have said um, and all that you have done for so many years to champion the cause of more and better domestic financing, which, as you set out so powerfully, is needed more and ever. In addition to domestic financing and aid to education, Strengthening international coordination to address the debt crisis is critical to create the fiscal space to invest in education. In an article I recently co-authored with IPNET's regional representative of for Africa, Professor Julius, I was alarmed to discover that in 2020, the federal government of Nigeria spent the equivalent of 83% of revenues to service debt money that could and should be spent instead on reducing the number of children out of school and providing them with quality education. To speak more about the need for concerned action on debt relief, I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Pamela McLaren, advisor and head of debt management unit at the Commonwealth Secretariat. Pamela, we look forward to hearing more about the unit's work and its relevance to education financing across Commonwealth countries. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of this um, dialogue. And um, let me say good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are, um, it's good to be here. I will start my conversation by, with a quote, and the quote is, the fundamental cure for poverty is not money, but knowledge. And this was said by Sir Arthur Lewis, Nobel Prize winner for economics. Education is one of the most effective drivers of development and poverty reduction in the world. It is therefore no surprise that budget allocations for education ranks among the top five highest allocation in developing Commonwealth countries. At the largest financier of education in the developing world, the World Bank Group current portfolio of education projects totaled 20.6 billion as at fiscal year end June 2020. Notwithstanding the progress made in developing countries, the World Bank estimates that approximately 260 million children are still out of primary and secondary school. Education should be a priority of several governments. However, the developing world continues to fund a significant portion of their gross financing needs, including needs for education with debt instruments. It is in this context that I want to highlight three main debt management issues which can hinder educational development and by extension, the achievement of sustainable development goal number four. Firstly, the issue of high unsustainable debt burdens continues to constrain the level of investment in education in many developing countries. This is because an increasingly larger portion of government revenue is diverted from investments in education to debt service. Achieving debt sustainability is therefore a crucial first step 
to free up resources for strengthening the educational system. Crucial to this is the reduction of the cost of the debt. Some countries continue to have very limited access to concessional financing sources. And as such, the issue of debt sustainability is compounded when countries must fund their development with debt contracted at market rates. Secondly, a crucial step for unlocking finance for education development is domestic market development. Implementing investor relation programs increase investor base and provide an opportunity for countries to access previously untapped resources through innovative financial instruments. Join an innovative finance model such as green bonds used to raise awareness and more than 500 billion in financing for the climate sector over the past decade. It is possible to issue innovative financial instruments such as education bonds and debt for education swaps to raise new resources for SDG4. Education bonds like green bonds can be used to raise awareness and divert new investments for educational development. It may also be an ideal time to revisit debt for education swaps. Research suggests that these innovative financial instruments were popular between the 18, 1980 and the 2000s, but they seem to have lost momentum since the beginning of 2010. Refocusing on debt for education swaps can perhaps present a feasible option for tapping into a socially conscious investor base to raise funding for education development programs. Both these instruments can promote a more inclusive approach to national development by encouraging citizens through domestic debt financing and the diaspora to play more active roles in their country's development. Debt relief should also be a consideration. And when I speak of debt relief, I'm advocating for write-off of debt and not a banded approach like suspension of debt service payments, which is welcome and a first step to provide some relief during the COVID pandemic, but rather countries need forgiveness of debt. Forgiveness would unlock significant resources in many countries which could be redirected to the education sector. Finally, at the core of the options I've articulated is the whole issue of debt transparency. Being aware of what is owed to which creditor and at what terms is a crucial first step towards crafting a plan and policy towards achieving and maintaining long-term debt sustainability. Over the years, the share of sovereign debt held by non-official bilateral and private creditors has increased in both the amount of debt and number of creditors. Debt transparency is therefore particularly important for countries with these evolving debt compositions who are considering debt relief, debt reorganization or debt restructuring. Having a full picture can help countries implement more effective policies and improve credibility with creditors, investors, and rating agencies. This will in turn help countries return to more sustainable debt service levels and release more revenue for investment in education. Also, it will definitely impact on the cost of debt. Debt transparency is also crucial for the widening of the domestic market. The more information investors have, the less uncertainty and risk is associated with the borrower. Hence, this can possibly translate into more favorable terms, including lower borrowing costs, while at the same time, 
helping countries achieve debt sustainability. Debt managers and debt management offices are excellent resources and should be allowed to be integrated in the part of this process. At the Commonwealth Secretariat, the Debt Management Unit continues to provide capacity building, technical assistance, and software solutions such as the Commonwealth Meridian to support transparency, capital market development, domestic market development, and debt sustainability analysis. Further, Commonwealth Meridian can also be used by countries to monitor and report on investments in education by assigning economic sector codes to classify these instruments. We therefore encourage countries to fully utilize the system and its capabilities as part of their enhanced monitoring to inform policy decision and to assess policy effectiveness, particularly in terms of education. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela, for your presentation. Every dollar spent on debt servicing is one less dollar for education. Mm -hmm. And it is great to see the Commonwealth play a leading role on the issue of debt relief. I'm pleased to now introduce our final speaker, Dr. Musarat Maisha Raza, chairperson of the Commonwealth Students Association, which she's a stalwart in her advocacy for youth rights and participation in decision-making. Dr. Raza is also a lecturer, uh, lecturer in biomedical sciences at the University of Exeter. Dr. Raza, thank you for being with us today to ensure that the voice of young people in the Commonwealth is represented. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. So thank you very much for having me on this panel today. It is my honor and my privilege to be among such esteemed speakers. I'm Dr. Maisha Reza, the chair of the Commonwealth Students Association, representing students across 54 Commonwealth countries. Much of what I will be speaking today, I believe world leaders already know. They have the data, they have the statistics, they have the research reports at their desks about the plight of marginalized children and youth around the world. We have also heard leaders speak on multiple occasions, attributing our challenges of poverty, hunger, unemployment, crime and violence, and a string of atrocities to the pandemic. While the pandemic has caused widespread devastation, it has not initiated the global crisis, but rather significantly amplified the already existing gaps and cracks that were left unresolved. The education crisis was one that existed long before the pandemic. Before the pandemic in 2018, children around the world were already faced with poor access to high quality education. 258 million children and adolescents were out of school in 2018. Moreover, 400 million primary school children lacked basic reading skills, highlighting the substandard quality of education many were afforded. At the height of the pandemic, over 1 billion children were locked out of school, and it is now estimated that the potential dropout numbers will range between 6.8 million and 10.9 million. As a result, our world is potentially walking into a $10 trillion loss in future earnings. We have heard over and over again that we are running out of funds to continue helping the marginalized members in our communities. But last year, high-income countries announced a COVID-19 fiscal relief response of about $8 trillion within the first six months, which was a much welcome move with the majority of the funds coming from G7 countries. But despite the unprecedented amounts allegedly intending to support the global economy, it did not support the majority of the people who work in it. Just a fraction has been allocated to those whose lives are most at stake from the multidimensional impacts of COVID-19. Before the pandemic, almost 20% of the world's children were living in extreme poverty, yet far from receiving 20% of the bailout, only 0.13% of multilateral funding sources and emergency appeals were allocated to the most vulnerable. Now, if our leaders allocated just 20% of the initial COVID-19 economic response packages announced by the G20 in March last year to the 20% most marginalized children in the world. It would be enough to fund a myriad of challenges. For instance, 
it would enable the cancellation of all external debt payments due from governments of low income countries in 2020 and 2021. It would also provide two years of external funding gap to achieve good quality universal education from pre-primary to secondary education in all low and lower middle income countries. And it would have also closed the financing gap to help achieve the health SDG, SDG3 in all low and middle income countries until 2030. So we see that it is not just COVID-19 that is exacerbating global inequality. The world's unjust economic response to COVID-19 is deepening global inequality for at least a generation. The most marginalized and vulnerable have, left, have been left to fend for themselves and millions of children will pay the price with their lives. Hundreds and millions of children have long been excluded from reliable access to quality public education, sanitation or public health care or any kind of social protection measures or safety net. And a direct consequence of the national lockdown during the pandemic have continued to lock children out of school. At the peak of the pandemic, 1.6 billion children were out of school or university with the, major with the majority being under 18. Although 80% of countries with such closures launched some form of distance learning program, almost half of all primary and secondary school students being targeted exclusively by online learning platforms did not in fact have access to internet at home. So millions of children dropping out of school could, could be forced to join child labor to make up for lost household income. Where lockdowns have eased, child laborers are already being trafficked back to work, reversing decades of education progress that we have made globally. In some countries, one percentage point increase in poverty could see at least 0.7% increase in child labor, and we know that an increase in poverty is extremely likely in the wake of COVID-19. UNICEF and ILO have already warned that we are seeing a rise in child labor, child slavery, and trafficking for the first time in two decades. This is a vicious cycle formed among child labor, poverty, and education. When families do not have enough income to survive, children are forced to work. And when a child is forced to work, they don't go to school. And when a child does not go to school, they will never have the means to escape poverty. COVID-19 will serve to deepen this cycle of exclusion, not just in the immediate aftermath of the pandemic, but potentially for generations to come. Over the past year, the Commonwealth Students Association, along with the All Africa Students Union, the European Students Union, OBESU and the Global Student Forum have been relentlessly advocating in solidarity, along with Nobel laureates and leaders to dedicate 20% of multilateral funds to 20% of the most vulnerable children. We recommended that public and private lenders must cancel and forgive debt, um, debt to free a budget to spend on quality national education plans, which continue to reduce out of school numbers and increase retention and completion. Donor governments must fully fund the education cannot wait appeal for education in emergencies and the global partnership for education to enable the maximum possible grant making capacity for lowest income countries. Donor governments must commit to retaining or increasing aid commitments to education over the next two years in order to close the education financing gap. And finally, low and lower middle income countries must meet or continue to meet 20% um, target for domestic financing to be allocated to education that our esteemed panel member, Dr. Sarah Ruto from the Ministry of Education in Kenya has committed today. And the Commonwealth Students Association welcomes this commitment and applauds you. We are, urge more countries to follow your example. International agencies like Global Partnership for Education, World Bank and UNICEF have provided the main source of funding for low and lower middle income countries during the pandemic, which have been critical and essential. However, there are short term solutions which are like band-aids on a deep wound. COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in income losses, which will be greater for low income countries which are exposed to lose almost twice as much as middle income, middle, upper middle income countries and more than three times as much for high income countries, resulting in budget adjustments and reprioritization away from education. Governments must implement long-term funding opportunities to ensure sustainability. Innovative funding models will help to address learning challenges, 
build a more resilient education system in case of future shocks, as well as enhance school performance of vulnerable and at-risk children by helping to mobilize additional resources to address financing gap of public education in a more effective, efficient, and equitable manner. Research from the Commonwealth Innovation Financing for Public Education report shows from six case study countries that public-private partnerships and crowdfunding have been the most popular innovative finance mecha mechanisms employed. The report also encourages governments to adopt performance-based aids and impact bonds to improve learning outcomes. These mechanisms will allow monitoring during implementation and also allows for corrective action to be taken to achieve better results. However, impact assessments need to take place to identify the best model of innovative financing. We recommend that governments employ technical expertise, which will be critical to the uptake of innovating financing mechanisms, especially where governments lack internal capacity to monitor and evaluate the appropriate innovative financing models that have been implemented. Establishing an education-focused innovative finance department in the government can be tasked with evaluation and support of innovating finance mechanisms to close the education gaps. Innovative financing models appear to be the sustainable path to solving long-term educational challenges, and we urge governments to actively implement it. At this point, young people and students are at crossroads between fulfilling their economic potential in the long run through education and contributing to their families' immediate sustenance and their basic survival. This is an extremely unfair choice that we are having to make. We need leaders to act in partnership with students, youth, NGOs, nonprofit organizations, private sector, and investors to ensure that we do not lose a generation due to the lack of access to education. As the Secretary General mentioned in her speech, we need you to make bold and unconventional commitments moving away from popular decisions to allocating sufficient resources to the most vulnerable families and children, not just with cash handouts, which are short-term solutions, but to couple it with solutions to tackle multiple forms of deprivation, such as improved access to healthcare, free quality public education, both in the short term and for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Reza, for those powerful remarks. It is absolutely critical that as a political leader, we not only listen and act on the issues raised by young people across the Commonwealth, but empower them to use their voice. I now want to open up for a short panel discussion with some questions to our speakers. If I can ask for brief responses so we can hear from our panelists, please. If I can come to you first, Baroness Scotland, across the Commonwealth, we have some of the biggest education donors and education leaders like Singapore, alongside countries with the highest out, out of school op populations and biggest rates of learning poverty. What role can the Commonwealth Secretariat play to advance progress in closing these gaps and spreading the opportunity and benefits of education across our Commonwealth of Nations? Well, as you know, we have a formidable history in our Commonwealth of 54 countries looking after 2.4 billion people of coming together in comity and sharing knowledge, understanding and experience. I'm really thrilled that we are having this debate now because as you know, we will be preparing for the Commonwealth Educational Education Minister's meeting. And at that meeting, it's an opportunity for all of us, all 54 of us, to focus on where we want together to go, not least because education is absolutely pivotal to the delivery of all the sustainable development goals. And if we are to bridge the gap about which we've been talking today, it's going to be critical that we build that solidarity and that we leave no one behind. So in all the things we're doing, creating the frameworks, creating the, uh, the templates, coming together, pooling our innovation, sharing our expertise, working out what works, but also what does not work so that we can get there faster. I think we will remain a totally dedicated uh, partner at the Secretariat, but remember we have 89 
uh, accredited organizations. So it's going to take all of us, the whole Commonwealth, working together, all our sister bodies with one voice saying that we are committed to doing this and we will do it. Yes, we will do it. Dr. Ruto, if I can come to you next. Universal endorsement of President Kenyatta's statement across the Commonwealth would affirm the principle that access to quality education opportunity is at the heart of the Commonwealth. What impact do you think this would achieve in closing the education financing gap and what response have you received so far from fellow Commonwealth countries? The opportunity that the GP replenishment gives us is to energize us into what uh, all our countries at least have in our various constitutions as our commitment, constitutional commitment to giving education to uh, our children. Um, sadly, we sometimes fall short. And therefore it is important to use this community opportunity to re-energize our commitment to this particular course. And um, so first of all, it is something that's, that is re-energizing us within Kenya, because you cannot call upon somebody else to do something that you yourself are not doing. And I think responsibility, as they say, charity begins at home. So that is important to state that this commitment is there. Secondly, we have also seen, um, 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 I think a, a lot of renewed commitment and passion from uh, both uh, members uh, of the Commonwealth and, uh, and other countries, starting with the recognition that that responsibility begins with looking at and strengthening the financing within. So that as has been stated before, uh, the money that comes here just catalyzes, accelerates what needs to be done. And as has been stated, if the, the global call for me is an, is, is an act of, um, it gives us an act of agency to do, which is, we, is, is a responsibility and a commitment that is there in our laws and regulations within the country. And therefore, if we use this as pressure points, both within and at different levels, I think it will allow us to get to where we want to go. Thank you so much. Professor Levin, a major issue facing many Commonwealth countries is limited or no available data, which makes it difficult to track overall levels of financing and determine whether resources are being spent effectively. How can Commonwealth countries be supported to make better use of their investments in education? Okay, got you now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, very good question. Um, the data question sits there looking at us. We all would, all would like to have more data and more accurate data. But if we wait for it, we'll fail to act. We have to distinguish very clearly between the kind of data that it would be nice to have and the kind of data um, uh, that, that is actually necessary to make a decision. And many other things that we talk about, like the learning crisis, we don't need to, to measure and measure and measure yet again the fact that uh, an unacceptable proportion of children can't read at the age of 10. We know that and simply keep demonstrating it that it's not helpful. What is needed in that case, of course, is the kind of data which exists at a child level, at the school level, at the classroom level, at the formative assessment level that can be used to change practice to help those children who can't read uh, learn how to read. Uh, the, the question you put really invites the observation that you should never collect data unless you know which decision it's going to inform. If you don't understand why you're collecting the data, you'll surely collect the wrong data. And there is, believe me, an infinite amount of data that you could collect. So I think on a lot of the critical questions, we do actually know the kind of parameters of the problem in the, written in a big picture. Uh, and we know that we should be acting. Now, by all means, try and refine that diagnosis, try and collect more data, um, uh, but don't let that stand in the way of acting. If you translate this discussion to this story about tax, 
we all we do know, and though people may wish not to know, um, that many countries collect very small amounts of tax as a ratio of GDP, and they will never be able to finance uh, without external assistance. Uh, the public services they say they're committed to provide, nor, nor will they act, actually provide them. And so we have to look again and, and, and say, look, there's a whole variety of things you can now do with data and not least to do with revenue. Property taxes in many poor countries are almost non-existent. The property is easily identified with remote sensing. Money is being digitized, which means you can track transactions. Uh, you can use PAY systems, PAYE systems on people who are employed. All these things put together, including, of course, all the money, money laundering stuff and the data that flows around tax identification numbers, which say to citizens, if you want to be part of the state, you must have a tax identification number. Otherwise, you don't um, deserve to receive any services. These are all good things to do with data, data management and data use which can be democratizing and which can certainly act on the piece of the equation, if you remember the three elements, the size of the child population that needs educating, and the um, amount of money we, we allocate to them and the uh, tax base that is generating that money. It's the tax base that we can actually improve. And that's the good news story. In 1985, Africa received twice as much in aid as it generated in tax revenue. In 2015, the opposite was true. That changes the discussion. The discussion is not about have we got the money. The question is, what do we do with the money that we've got? Now that's oversimplifying, obviously, and it doesn't apply to every country. Uh, but it's a good starting point to remind people. Um, there's a lot of good news out there and that tax revenues are rising and will rise. And the question then becomes, how, does, uh, how, we, how, do, we, how do we deploy the benefits from that? Thank you so much. Dr. Raza, among the Commonwealth's 54 member countries, almost half are small island developing states, including some of the most vulnerable countries in the world to climate change. Given the climate crisis, how important is it for increased investments to build resilient education systems that can mitigate the risk of climate change? Thank you so much, Madam Chair, for that question. You're absolutely right. I mean, in fact, um, just a week or two ago, I was sitting on this um, panel with OECD um, and UNESCO and Education International to talk about the importance of climate resilient education, about governments investing in climate resilient education to embed um, climate change education and climate preservation within the school curriculum. And we've also been pushing for governments to, um, governments to um, provide funding and um, recognition for children to become leaders. I think often we see that you know, um, children are not taken seriously. Even as student leaders, we're not taken very seriously. We're looked at as a lot of, um, at a lot of times in a consultative status, but we're requesting governments and school administration to partner with students and partner with children because they can become agents of change for climate preservation. They have a very unique positioning where they have access to their families and access to schools. So not only can they engage in climate change education and preservation and projects and leadership within the school, they can also help to make that local level revolution within their homes. And that kind of change can actually um, be very sustainable and have a long-term impact. So our one of our main recommendations was to encourage governments to in to ensure that climate change education is embedded within the curriculum so that we can empower children and young people and students to take on the leadership of, of um, you know, climate action. Because up till now, about um, a majority of 15 year olds don't really know what they can do for climate change. They don't have that necessary um, you know, required knowledge. So our job is to ensure that from schools and teachers, they empower young people and children with that knowledge and with that appropriate tools and let us use that to bring forward um, the climate preservation movement that we so need right now. Thank you. Yeah, we do. We really do need that movement. And finally, Pamela, President Kenyatta's statement calls on development partners to voluntarily uh, channel their special drawing rights, including from the new allocation to lower income countries in need of liquidity support in these exceptional times, in particular to support 
education financing. Could you speak more about how likely it is that development partners will comply with that? And what can be expected from the new allocation of special drawing rights? Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, I, I do think that there will be some support from development partners because for some, and as I said earlier, education unlocks development. And one of the things that um, development partners are focused on, and I think maybe we saw a little bit of it recently, just yesterday in the UK, they want countries to be self-sufficient and to reduce aid that they are providing countries. So if they can support these new initiatives from the World Bank IMF to support countries, they certainly will. I, 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 do, I do believe that. Uh, it is also crucial that low income countries find ways to make themselves um, sustainable in terms of unlocking resources. It could be financing resources. It could be revenue as well to channel that to the education sector. So countries need to, governments need to, in their development plan, to have a clear cut strategy on how we are going to move forward. How are we going to change what is happening? How are we going to empower our young people, for example, because they are the future. And with education, just the thinking alone is crucial, very, you know. Another thing I think that maybe that we should be looking at is entrepreneurship. So that also is a good avenue for growth and development and for poverty allevi alleviation. Um, in terms of debt, I just want to talk about that a little bit. I think uh, sometimes debt is not well targeted. So countries, you see countries are boring, 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 and they are not targeting those resources into the right area. And the elephant in the room. So you'll have some countries that have contracted significant amount of debt, but because of corruption, those funds are not used effectively to promote growth and better outcomes for their citizens. So these are some of the things that we need to look at to consider. Um, just to touch on a little bit about statistics in terms of debt management, a significant number, actually 45 of our Commonwealth member countries actually use the systems that are um, delivered by the Commonwealth Secretary. These are software systems for countries to manage their debt portfolio. So if they actually use the systems effectively, it provides them with good data and their borrowing um, styles, what they are borrowing for, which sectors they are borrowing for. And policymakers, knew, you need to use this information to feed into their development plan. So, in terms of the sectors that they want to support, whether it's education or health, is another key area to climate. So, policymakers need to be very strategic and to use the data that is available out there. There's lots of data that is available, but is it being used effectively? Thank you, Pamela. I so agree with you that data is so important for uh, policymakers as well as legislators as well. Uh, so we are almost out of time. So if, we can, if I can ask you all one final question in turn. What is your one hope that the Global Education Summit delivers for Commonwealth member countries? And I'll go first with uh, Baroness Scotland. Well, I hope that they will all commit to replenish the fund so that we will have the money that, in, that we need, we vitally need to fulfill the aspirations that we have committed ourselves to. And I also hope, if I can have a second one, that mm -hmm. we will invest even more into the data collection. We've got it in our innovation hub, but there's an opportunity for us through the Universal Vulnerability Index to really rebalance the way we spend that money. But if we replenish and we're committed and we work together as one, 
I really think we have an opportunity to achieve this if we choose. And I know everyone on this call, we are choosing. Yes, we are choosing indeed. Dr. Ruto? I hope that especially the countries whose systems of education still need developing will commit to at least 20% of their budgets coming to education. This means that before you ask for a friend to support you, you yourself must ensure that you are getting the domestic financing uh, needed so that we are the ones putting in our money first, first and foremost. Secondly, I hope that the countries who have a little bit more will also support those that need so that together as a globe, we are moving in one direction, but responsibility starting within. Thank you so much. I so agree with uh, the importance of domestic finances and working together. Uh, Professor uh, Levin. Thank you, yes. Uh, of course, I support the replenishment of the GPE. Um, uh, I think my disappointment, if there is one, is that we experience replenishment every three to five years. And of course, the, the more successful we are, the less we have to be. Um, because what we should be doing is not collecting money to spend, but changing the way in which we finance systems so that they are self-sustained. That surely is the core. So that um, my wish for the replenishment, first of all, that it is successful. Secondly, that as a result, a proportion of the funds that are raised are used for fiscal reform, because the fiscal reform would itself be aid to education. Remember that. I mean, if you, if you get, the, get the revenue side of the equation right, you generate financing that lasts indefinitely, that doesn't have to be replenished because it's being replenished from the tax base. So it seems to me that that would be a good a direction in, in, in which to move. And, uh, and, there, and, and, and it would be a new direction in which to move if you couple it with the idea that aid should be catalytic. Aid is not about solving problems directly. It's about creating systems that solve problems permanently. It's more about landfill than about bridges, if you think about it. Thanks Thank you so much. Very inspiring. Uh, Dr. Raza? Thank you, Madam Chair. I think I'd just like to reiterate um, just a few of my hopes um, from the summit. I hope that, we hope actually, that um, you know, public and private lenders cancel and forgive their debt for um, lower and uh, lower and lower middle income countries because we need, we, we can't afford that. And we need to free up the budget to be able to spend on education. And we want, um, you know, all the governments and especially higher income countries to fund the Education Cannot Wait campaign and replenish the funds as uh, my other esteemed panelists mentioned. The third one I want to echo what Dr. Ruto said is for um, lower and middle lower income countries to continue to commit 20% of their domestic financing for education. And finally, as we say at every single speech, we want governments to partner with young people, partner with students, not engage us just in a consultative or tokenistic manner, but to have us on at decision making tables because we have time and time again shown the capacity that we bring towards this and you can't do it without us. So please commit to engaging with us. Absolutely. I so agree that government uh, and national and international need to uh, partner with the younger population. Colleagues, thank you for those very illustrative remarks and for finding the time to be part of today's fantastic discussion. I very much hope that our governments take on board the recommendations of today's event. This is a critical time for the future of Pakistan and all Commonwealth countries. As we have heard, we must not waste the opportunity that the Global Education Summit provides. We need bold action and leadership from the Commonwealth and all its member countries to galvanize the effort to fund and deliver 12 years of quality education for every Commonwealth child. And let's remember today, the summit is not the end of this process. It has been fantastic to see the governments of the Kenya and the UK come together as co-hosts of this summit. I hope that leadership will continue and education features firmly as a priority of rearranged Commonwealth heads of government meeting. 
I want to finish by thanking all the partners for their involvement in facilitating today's fantastic discussion and for your ongoing leadership in advancing the right of all children in the Commonwealth to access the quality education they deserve. And once more, thank you to all our brilliant speakers. I hope you all enjoy the rest of the summit.